This is the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Kendall of the notaballerina.com travel blog. Every episode, I'll share travel tales from several fellow travel lovers, and together we hope to entertain and inspire you, remind you of some of your own great travel experiences, and encourage you to hit the road again soon. Hello and welcome to episode 307 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast, which is all about when things go wrong at sea. I'd like to pay my respects firstly to the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, where I'm recording this podcast today. Now, I'm sure I've probably mentioned over the years that podcast episodes about things going wrong on our travels are always popular. Uh, It's a, I don't know, just a curious fact of human nature, I suppose. We're interested. And I really like making these episodes too, because my guests seem to be especially good storytellers when something goes wrong. Perhaps it's like a story they've told many times over. Perhaps it's because it's really emotionally meaningful to them, but they always make for good stories. And, you know, above all, that's something I really, really love. So in this episode, I have two stories of things going wrong at sea, one near Jamaica and one near Indonesia, so opposite sides of the world, but both very intriguing stories. Uh, And I guess I always say this to my guests when they tell me these stories that I know already you know, spoiler alert, they survived because they are here to tell me the tale. Uh, And I'm always very glad of that because sometimes it's hard to know how it would end up otherwise. Now, uh, I'm happy also to report. So usually you'd know I like to tell my own relevant story before I share my guests' stories. But I don't really have much to share along these lines. Nothing going terribly wrong at sea, which is a huge relief. Uh, My first guest, though, does talk about life sailing a catamaran, so I have a tiny story. We actually had a very, very small second-hand catamaran when I was a kid, which we would sail on on the Peel Harvey estuary south of Perth. And I still remember a time, I don't know how old I was, maybe 11 or 12, I suppose, when our mast snapped, I was out sailing with my dad. And I couldn't stand, it's a pretty shallow estuary in many parts, but in this part I couldn't stand and my dad was still taller than me. He still is taller than me to this day, actually, but he must have been significantly taller. So maybe I was nine or ten. And I sat on the tramp of the catamaran while my dad walked me and the catamaran home. So thanks, Dad. I still remember that. I was uh, like Queen Muck sitting up there being kind of escorted home. So, yes, I've had this tiny catamaran experience, but very thankfully, nothing like the experience my first guest had. So this is Antonio Carla to tell us about uh, his experience of something going wrong at sea on his travels. My wife and I, we, um, we were very fortunate to be able to, um, to buy a sailboat, uh, in this case a, a catamaran, small catamaran, and we live on it for a few years and traveling around. So we, we started in the Caribbean, we're kind of beginners obviously, we, we had some sailing experience before but very little. So we decided to start in the Caribbean because there's a lot of islands nearby, so you can always have help nearby. You don't, you know, go for like two weeks, go cross an ocean the first day. Yeah, right? sensible. So, <laughs> so by this time, we have some experience. Six months, we travel, uh, kind of, they call the West Indies of the Caribbean. So mm-hmm. from northern Venezuela, like Grenada is where we started particularly. All the island chain up north to Bahamas and end up in Miami. And then the next step of the and the next leg of the journey was well we it's hurricane season is starting so we need to get the boat out of Florida and Bahamas so we're gonna take it to Panama and um, eventually we want to cross the South Pacific that was the the whole goal getting to Australia so this will be a great opportunity to if we do a straight from Miami all the way to Panama it's gonna be about 10 14 days of passage so it'll give us experience to be out there on our own and you know getting getting our sea legs and experience mm. built up mm-hmm. to do that you just go so we left miami and went through the bahamas very slow passage not a lot of wind uh, very very slow and it was just a normal passage until we got into Cuba, between Cuba and Haiti. That's kind of the way you go because of the winds. Right, yeah. Haiti is kind of uh, a little bit, it can be a little bit dodgy. Um, there's some people being assaulted uh, of that coast. So tensions start to build. Um, we hit into, get into bad weather, like a lot of lining and 
when you're sailing at night and you see the lining very close to you, there I can tell you that's scary. A bit. <laughs> anyway, so by this time we already maybe like a week into the trip, so it's only my wife and I we're already starting to be very tired because one of us always has to be awake. Yeah, that's and, tough. Um, so you 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 sleep deprived and continue sailing, and once you leave and and with the Haiti thing we. I always want to be awake or kind of being around mm. for my wife as well. Mm, mm. Um, so once we leave Haiti, things well. Now it's all all good. Well, it wasn't. Weather started to pick up. We have a lot of wind, a lot, a lot of wind, and a lot of waves. Um, so we have around waves that are about three to four meters coming from the side. Uh, kind of 90 degrees and that's the worst thing you can want when you're on a boat because if you got the wind the waves on the side it's very unstable you get seasick mm -hmm. it's, everything is flying around on the boat <laughs> yeah. uh, it's the oh. worst angle that you want right? Mm -hmm. and you pair that with like 30 knots of wind or 35 it was just nasty and in sailing, normally, when, when the more wind you have, the less sail you want to have out, right? Mm -hmm. So as the wind picks up, you reduce the amount of sail that you have, and just for safety reasons. The mm -hmm. worst thing you can have is a very big sail out and a lot of wind, and then it's overpowered and you can't bring it down. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's going to get dark, and at night we always sail conservatively. So we try to go a bit slower. We always make this the cell a little bit smaller because if the wind conditions pick up during the night while well, you're ready it's, and mm. so for that yeah and it can get a little bit technical but um basically what happens is in order to bring the sail up so the sail works with that with a line with a rope i, I want to use nautical terms here just so Sorry, if you, any cruiser in the audience, I know that you don't call a rope a line. <laughs> no, no, and every I, li rope has a name. But you're going to call it ropes and pulleys and sails. I appreciate so the layman's understand. terms. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So basically, the sail has a, um, has a rope attached to it, to the top of the sail. And that goes up to the mast. There's a pulley on the mast. And then the, the rope goes down. So when you pull the line down, when you pull the rope down, the sail goes up. And then... Okay, that's, and then when you bring the sail down, the, the rope has to go up, right? Got it. So when you're sailing with a big sail up, you normally have a lot of rope. The scope is tied up somewhere, right? Because when you're going to bring it down, that line has to go up. So anyway, the weather is so bad that we're bouncing around, bouncing around, that when I'm going to go to the front, because in order to bring the sail down, you got to face into the wind mm. otherwise you can't bring the sail down it's too strong right and for that you need to start an engine because there's so much wind that you can't turn the boat just by sail by, with with the with the turning wheel so i tell my wife okay you want to start the engine i'll go up front to bring the the sail down you're gonna go to the mast cool she started the engine and five seconds later the engine stops oh no what happened so i go up front and i see the rope that was to be to be tight somewhere because all the bouncing around oh no it just fell into the tramp and the, the catamarans they have kind of like a trampoline up front mm -hmm. went through the tramp go in the water all the way back and it got stuck in the propeller oh no right okay so there we are with 30 knots of wind four meter waves coming from the side and the problem of that is that you cannot cut the rope because if you cut the rope, it goes all the way up, they sail down, you don't have any power. Yeah. Yep. You can move the boat. Mm -hmm. We have another engine. That's one. But we have another engine, one or other engine, but we, the other one doesn't work. And if we cut the rope, you know, we, we only have one engine mm -hmm. and the, the front sail to go all the way to Panama, 400 miles away. Oh, That's like gosh. about 550 kilometers or 600 kilometers. It's a long way. And at the end of, the, of that passage is very famous, is very well known that before Panama, you are day motoring because there's no wind. Uh, it's very common. Right. So at that time, it's going to get dark. We make the decision, look, let's turn 90 degrees. We just passed Jamaica. Jamaica is about 90 miles away. It's downwind. If we go to Jamaica, there's a big... We've never been to Jamaica with a boat. But there's a big bay in there that I think we can just drop the anchor and I can jump in the water and kind of trying to fix it. Right. 
Okay, cool. <sighs> we turn the bow and then suddenly we have all the wind from the back, right? Because the wind was coming at 90 degrees from the side. When we turn 90 degrees right, now we have all the wind from the back. Mm-hmm. And that is the most dangerous thing on a catamaran because oh, the catamaran doesn't flip sideways. The catamaran flips <sighs> when you have a lot of wind from the back mm-hmm. that you dip the, the bow mm-hmm. and then flips. Oh. So that's extremely dangerous. Yeah, right. So we try to kind of back wind. Uh, we surfing four meter waves, pitch dark, 30 knots of wind. Uh, the front sail, we can bring it down because it's all stuck in this fair leg. We can't do anything. Uh, the big sail, you know, like banging all around. We try to back win a little bit. The autopilot doesn't work because the boat is a mess. So we are hand steering half an hour each all the way to Jamaica for the whole night. Right? The whole night, 30, and then trying to steer half an hour, then my wife half an hour, then I go half an hour, then she goes half an hour. We fa- do the whole night. This is after we've been a week of being sleep deprived, right? So, yeah, really you're bad. not in top condition to start we with. Go- <laughs> yeah, we not, we're not sharp at all, right? Uh, so then we, morning comes finally, it's about six o'clock in the morning, the sun starts to rise, and we're getting close to this uh, bay. The wind hasn't slowed down. We still have 30 knots, we've broken some of the lines. I hold the sail, but still kind of shapes, you know, stays there. Sail-ish. And then I tell my wife, okay, before we go into the bay, because the idea is we go into this bay, where it's very wide, we're not going to hit anybody. Mm-hmm. We drop the anchor. Once we drop the anchor, the, the boat is going to turn into the wind. The big sail won't catch any wind, and then I can jump in the water, and tie the rope from the propeller, and then we can bring the sail down. Cool. Mm, we get in there, and the winds are picking even more. Oh, no. Okay, okay. So we need an engine to get into the bay. Without mm-hmm. the engine, we're not going to get in there. Okay, right. We have one. Cool. But before we start it, let's pick up the scope. So the line is attached to the propeller, but then there's more line coming up after the propeller, right? Right, yeah. So We don't want that in the other engine. So we grab that. <laughs> yeah, we grab that. We tie it to the bow so it doesn't get stuck. Okay, cool. She goes start the engine, and we're kind of closer to the bay now. About a mile, she starts the engine and the engine stops. Oh no. I mean, what happened? What happened? So, what happened is we have a big slope from the front to the propeller. So, what was in front of the propeller, oh. that part of the rope got stuck in the other oh, propeller. No. And now we have 30, 35 knots of wind and we're heading to the rocks. Like, oh. we can't steer the bow, we oh, don't no. have any engines. And, and this is Jamaica, Sunday, 7 o'clock in the morning, right? <laughs> I assume no and, one is and out. Said, look, <laughs> no one's like, watching. Look, there's nobody's <laughs> going to turn up. Like, there's, there's no way, no way anybody's going to turn up. <laughs> so at this point, we're going to the rocks. We can't turn the boat. Oh, it's too much wind. No. The steering, it's just, it's just too much wind. It's overpower. We go into the rocks and we have a, a, a e-perv, right? Like a mm-hmm. personal locator beacon. Mm-hmm. Say, look, we, we need to put a, a call. Mm. When you're sailing, there's different calls, like depending on what happens, okay. different levels, right? So you got the mayday, which is like somebody's dying, basically. Mm-hmm. So it's a, a life mm-hmm. in danger. Yep. And then you got a pan pan, which is you got a technical problem. Nobody's dying, but you need help right, right. now. Okay. And then you got another one that is more like, yeah, if you if you can, it'll be nice if you help us out. I don't I don't remember that that word. Anyway, I I tell my wife like, you put a mayday right now because otherwise nobody's going to take it serious. <laughs> like you put a mayday and then we'll deal with that later. Anyway, we we set up the beacon, we get the radio, mayday, mayday, blah blah blah. Nobody's going to reply. What? You know what? We like I don't know maybe. 300 meters from the rocks. An American guy replied from his boat that he's in Jamaica. And he said, give me the coordinates. Where are you? And I said, ooh, okay. Here you go. These are the coordinates. Where are the coordinates? Blah, 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 blah. We send them. Can you call someone? You know, we're calling the, 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 the Coast Guards. Nobody picks up the phone. We're calling a marina that is there. Nobody's picking up the phone. Uh, can you say, don't worry, I'll call them. So this guy who is on his boat, 
I guess, goes and wakes up people. And, <laughs> and, and 20 minutes later, the Jamaican Coast Guards coming with a white dude with them. Oh, just this guy, this American guy. Way. <laughs> yeah, like I, I assume at that point that must be this guy. It doesn't look Jamaican to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, fair enough, they tie their boat to, to our catamaran and they, you know, power ourselves into the bay and they tied us to a marina. And then I finally, uh, I said, well, now I can jump into the, the water to fix everything. I said, no, you got to wait for whoever the custom is. I said, well, the boat is going to go away, man. It's like 30 knots blowing. Let me fix it and then we can do customs. But um, long story short, they help us out. Oh, thank they goodness. They rescue us from there. They say, are you the guys setting up the beacon because the Americans call us, American government, American um, Coast Guard, sorry, call us, uh, telling us there's a beacon going off oh, on our coast. Yeah, right. So that's you, cool. And long story short, they didn't even charge us a dollar. Oh, really? Wow. It's just, yeah. <laughs> That's so good. And then we have amazing two weeks in Jamaica. <laughs> An in, unexpected we met so many holiday people. in Jamaica. Yeah. Oh, we amazing. met a lot of people who had problems with the boat staying in Jamaica and the Jamaican people were great. So, yeah. Um, oh, that's so that good. Was, that was the end of it. Happy <sighs> story. Yeah, but. Uh, yes, a happy story in the end, I guess. Although I would not want to live through that. I would possibly not be getting back on that catamaran ready to sail off uh, towards Australia again. But uh, Antonio and his wife are braver than me in that sense. So well done. (laughs) Now, my other guest today is Imogen LaPere, and she had uh, a very intriguing experience sailing near Indonesia. Just a warning that parts of this story maybe make it not really safe for kids' story. So use your discretion. It was in 2019 when I was in Indonesia and I was sailing to a tiny group of islands called the Spice Islands. Um, And there are a tiny archipelago of 10 islands. Some of them are only one kilometre long. But in the 17th century, Portugal, Britain and Holland had essentially an arms race over them because they were the only place in the world where nutmeg grew. Oh, wow. I was doing this story which involved sailing to the Spice Islands um, for a magazine called Suitcase. It was We were sailing on a traditional Phoenici, which are the wooden sailing ships of Indonesia. Beautiful, beautiful ships. And it had 12 passenger cabins on board. But the night before we were due to sail, there was actually a tsunami and all the other passengers cancelled the trip. Oh. But being a a hungry, young freelancer, it was one of my very first freelance gigs. There was no way I was going to cancel it. <laughs> so me and the photographer, who was actually my boyfriend at the time, were the only passengers on the boat. Wow. Um, and yeah, and then a crew of, I think there were 16 Indonesian sailors. And the sea was so rough that the, the waves were crashing over the deck. Oh. So... We had to, yeah, so we, we had to stay below deck the whole time and, and just basically be in bed. And at one point, it looked like they would even have to tie us to our beds, but it oh. didn't quite come to that. But God. yeah, and so it kind of it went on like this for about three days. And then eventually it calmed. And we went up on deck for the first time in three days. And it was really beautiful the bluest water, the bluest skies. And we were in between two tiny islands. Indonesia has, I think it's 18,000 islands and 6,000 of them are inhabited. So some don't even have names. These two were very small. And when they saw that our boat had dropped anchor in between them, the local tribe radioed in and asked us for a sack of rice in exchange for anchoring there. So obviously we gave it to them. And they told us that in this particular stretch of water, there was a dugong. And I don't know if you're familiar what dugongs are. They're these kind of strange, they're also known as sea cows. They're very, very long. They're about, well, I think they're about seven feet long, actually. And they kind of look like manatees or walruses, but they're more bulbous. Um, And in Indonesia, they're very, very sacred for quite a few different reasons. For a start, 
their reproductive organs look very like humans and so people think that maybe that's kind of where the myth of mermaids come from and their tears are believed to be a very very potent aphrodisiac and they're very rare and our captain was this guy called Dolphy and he was a seventh generation sailor and he but he'd never seen a dugong and he'd always wanted to wow the one thing the tribe said to us was definitely get in get in the dinghy and go look for him but just make sure you don't get in the water with him so me the photographer Dolphy and two other sailors got into the dinghy and we went out into the water and we kind of killed the engine and we um, played with the surface of the water and dugongs are very curious and very playful and he came to see us oh wow and he was just beautiful huge absolutely huge and it was a really thrilling moment they're so mysterious looking they're so dinosaur like and Dolphy just couldn't contain himself and went against the tribe's orders and dived into the water. And there was this kind of lull while when the dugong had disappeared and Dolphy was just in the water and none of us could really see what was going on. And then suddenly the dugong came up behind him and grabbed him with both its flippers and started trying to rape him. And yeah, dugong penises oh. are kind of like elephants in terms of ratio to body size yeah it was this kind of really crazy sight it ended up taking both the sailors strength to pull Dolphy back into the boat because dugongs are very strong yeah um wow so we got him back into the boat and obviously he was very scared and very bruised and um we told the yeah we told the tribe leader what had happened they basically said that Dugong's mate for life, and he ha- the the dugong in question had had a mate, and a fishing boat had killed her, oh. and he's now cripplingly lonely, and yeah, was probably trying to pull Dolphy down to be his new mate, oh and I I write about sustainability. That's that's my or, and kind of ethical travel. That's my special interest. And I just, something about this image of kind of humans raping nature and then nature kind of raping back was just really um, striking to me. Yeah, so super intriguing experience for Imogen there. Uh, You know, really gave me food for thought too. So that is my episode of Things Going Wrong at Sea. It uh, makes me want to stay on land for a while, I must confess. But a huge thank you to both my guests for sharing their stories so beautifully. You can find more about them, firstly, by um, looking up Antonio Carla at Adventure Fix. Uh, His website is adventurefix.co. And Imogen is at imogenlapairewriter.com. She has uh, a recent book called The Ethical Traveller, 100 Ways to Roam the World Without Ruining It, which is a great kind of uh, uh, overview of lots of different ways we can be better and more thoughtful travellers. Speaking of being thoughtful travellers, do come along and join either our Facebook group or LinkedIn group for thoughtful travellers or both if you want. We talk about different things in each group. Uh, There's links in the show notes or just search for thoughtful travellers in those platforms. And for this episode, the show notes will be at notaballerina.com slash 307. Come and share your own tales of things going wrong. I love to hear all of them. So I hope nothing too badly has gone wrong on your recent travels in any case. And as always, thank you so much for listening. This has been another episode of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Show notes and other information are at notaballerina.com slash podcast. Join me again soon for another chat about why we travel. Bye for now. Bye for now.